Are you ready for God's word this day? Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, beginning with the 10th verse. Now to me, who, who am in less than the least of all of the saints, the grace was ever given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purposes which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. May God bless the reading and the hearing of these words. Let's try that again. May God bless the reading and hearing of these words. Amen. 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 Well, it's been a number of years ago, but I was invited to preach a revival in Zwally, Louisiana. Anybody know where Zwally, Louisiana is? No one, huh? All right, well, here, we got one. Well, let me give you a little hint. It's right next to Manny, Louisiana. Anybody know where Manny, Louisiana is? <laughs> All right, now, if you've driven up I-49, you know where Manny, Louisiana is. Well, let's just put it this way. This thing is out in the sticks, okay? It was about a four-hour drive, and, and I knew that if I was going to get there on time, I had to jump right in my car at the end of worship. So at the end of worship, we got done with greeting everybody. I ran into my office. I gathered all of my things together, and I jumped in the car, drove on up there, and had about 45 minutes prior to the service, I arrived at the pastor's house where I was going to stay. When I got my things unpacked and I went to reach for my Bible, lo and behold, the Bible was nowhere to be seen. So I walked out of my car and I began to scour the car itself and there was no Bible. I had forgotten the Bible. It was sitting on my desk back in my office. Now who goes to a revival and doesn't bring a Bible, huh? So we, 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 uh, went, I went over to the pastor and I said, look, I got to borrow one of your Bibles. So he gave me a loaner Bible and we got there and I preached that night's service. Well, everything went fine, and the next morning I was going to meet with some of the leadership of the church, and, and we were going to do a little bit of spiritual training, and, and as I got ready, uh, my eye started to itch, so I rubbed my eye, and lo and behold, my contact suddenly was gone. So I began to look around the counter and around the sink. I didn't find it there anywhere. I, I looked down on the floor. I was on all fours looking for everything. I looked on my body. It was nowhere to be seen which meant I had only one option to wear a pair of six-year-old glasses that I hated wearing. Well, so I was wearing my glasses, and, and we went and we met with the leadership. And then that evening, we got to church. We had a wonderful time of praise and worship. And the moment that I stood up to preach, there was a loud explosion. You see, in this small town of just a couple hundred people, and was powered by one substation, and that substation decided that it was going to explode, killing the power to the entire town. I thought, oh my gosh. So, now, I, I tell this story, and, and, you know, you may be thinking, well, these just might be, you know, three coincidences, you know? Uh, and, and so... That next day, I preached, and everything went fine, and then Wednesday morning, I woke up, we had breakfast, and as I was saying goodbye to my friend and colleague, I was pulling out of the driveway, wearing my glasses, and suddenly, my right eye went blurry. My contact that I thought had popped out of my eye literally had slid up under my eyelid and stayed there for two days. And the moment that I was leaving, the moment that I was no longer preaching a revival, it suddenly came back down and I was able to put the other contact in and drive home. That experience taught me something. That any time we seek to do something for the kingdom of God, any time we seek to advance the move of Jesus Christ, there is going to be opposition. There is going to be roadblocks that come our way. There is going to be things that come in and try to thwart what we're trying to do. 
You see, what you and I need to recognize and what this series is about is something that you and I don't talk about very much in the church, and that is there are angels and demons, there are principalities and powers, both seen and unseen, that are a part of this world, and they are in battle with one another. And you and I are caught up in that battle. You may not see it, you may not think about it, but you might not even believe it, but let me tell you, you are caught up in it whether you want to be caught up in it or not. And that means you and I need to be on guard. Pastor Mike Slaughter is one of our United Methodist pastors, and he tells the story of going back to Darfur, Africa. He had started a mission there and it has grown so that now hundreds of churches are contributing and sending volunteers to Darfur, a, a hunger and water ravaged nation that's torn in two by civil war. He was returning back to Darfur and they were getting ready to leave their base camp and to go to a community where they were building a church and digging a well so that for the first time in this small little village they could have fr fresh and clean water. But to get there, it was a six-hour journey on the back of a truck through the desert and very rugged terrain. It was, it was a very dangerous road. In fact, the, the local mission team that uh, they were working with had been under attack many times when they had gone out on this road. One mission worker had actually been killed. Another had been kidnapped, and two of the vehicles had been lost. So Mike was told that there will be no rest stops, there will be no potty breaks for this six hours. And as he began to talk to a UN official who was along the journey with them, the UN official said, uh, said this, don't trust your eyes. What you see with your eyes can be deceiving. It will look like calm, but the real danger lies with what you can't see. It is the unseen enemy looking, lurking in the barren brush that blends in with the crowd who represents the gravest of dangers. And that is exactly what it is for you and I living in this world with these powers and principalities who try to blend in and who often are invisible but who are active and at work against everything that we seek to be for Jesus and everything that we seek to do for the kingdom of God. How do you deal with this unseen reality? Well, a lot of it starts with your worldview. Are you familiar with that, that term, worldview? If you're not having to pull out your outline, I want to encourage you to do so at this moment and to fill in the blanks as we work our way through. A worldview essentially is a set of lenses through which we interpret and we understand and we perceive the world. Our worldview is influenced by many things, many times by things that you and I don't know and, and don't, aren't cognizant of. For example, our parents help determine what our worldview is. Our worldview is influenced by the things we watch on TV, the video games that we play, by the music that we listen to, by the news that we read, by the people we hang out with, by the communities and the neighbors in which we live. Where your worldview has been shaped many times by osmosis. It's not exactly a, a, a classroom experience where you go and learn this type of stuff. But here's the thing. Everybody has a worldview. And your worldview not only determines who you are, your worldview determines how you live your life and what you do with your life. You see, there are two worldviews in this world. There is the rationalistic worldview. This is a, a worldview that came into being during the Enlightenment. Go back to your European history back in the 17th century. It's like with people like Rene Descartes and other philosophers of, his, of their day that began to say that there is only one worldview and it is that worldview which is seen, that which is tangible, but most importantly, that which can be proven by science. Anything that cannot be proven by science is, is, uh, does not exist. But there is another worldview at operation in the world, and it is the majority. One of the things that we need to understand is that in the United States and in Europe, we are in the minority that adhere to the rationalistic worldview. You see, 
the rationalistic worldview came with the Puritans and the colonists to the United States. They brought with them this worldview and it has been incorporated into our educational system so that you and I trust only that which can be proven, only that which has scientific evidence. But the majority of the world has an open worldview. It affirms that there are things that can be explained and things that can be understand, understood through science itself, but there are also parts of life and parts of this world that cannot be measured. It cannot be tested through science, and that is the spiritual side of life. That there is that which is material and that which is in invisible, and it is the spiritual side of life that we cannot negate and we cannot ignore in life. You see this material dimension we are a part of because we can touch us and touch others and say because I see you, because I hear you, because I can touch you, I know that you exist. But there is a spiritual realm as well. And part of that spiritual realm are angelic beings. So this morning I want to talk a moment about angels and what the Bible has to say about them. Number one is that angels are mentioned throughout the scriptures. In 108 different instances, angels are mentioned in the Old Testament. But it's even more so in the New Testament. In more than 165 different times, angels are mentioned in the New Testament. We see this throughout the scriptures. For example, Daniel, when he's in the lion's den, and there spends the entire night and yet is completely unharmed because there are angels that are protecting him. Or when Jesus is in the wilderness and he's being tempted by Satan, it is angels who are ministering to him. Or if you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus testifies to the presence of angels when he says as he sees Peter draw his sword and to begin to battle and to take on and fight those that are coming to arrest Jesus. And he says to Peter, Peter, don't you think that if I wanted to, I could call down 10,000 angels and they would wage war. When Jesus died and when he was resurrected and Peter runs to the uh, tomb, who is there to meet Peter, but who? Angels. And the book of Revelation tells us that when Jesus comes back, he is going to be escorted by throngs of angels, hundreds if not thousands of angels as well. And so we see that there are angels throughout scripture uh, that are uh, a part of God's plan and God's work in the world. Here's one of the things that's not in your outline that I want you to write down. The actual name or word angel means messenger of God. And so that tells you something about the purpose of angels is that they are meant to be messengers of God. But angels also are personal. They are individual. They have individual names. And so one of the things, that, the names that we see is that of Gabriel. That should be familiar to you now that we're just past Christmas because it is the angel Gabriel who announces to Elizabeth that she is going to be pregnant with the forerunner of Jesus who then becomes John the Baptist. And it is Gabriel who makes the pronouncement to Mary, to Mary that she is going to be pregnant with God's only son. But there is another angel that we see as well, and his name is Michael. Michael is thought to be uh, the supreme angel, the one who is in charge of all of the other angels and making sure that they know what they're to be doing for God's will and God's work in this world. But there is a third name that is shared, a name that you know well, the name Lucifer. Now listen to me. Listen to what, the, remember what I told you about names in the Old Testament times and even in Jesus day that names had meanings names were your calling names were your destiny that you were to live out the name Lucifer that you and I when we hear that we immediately recoil we immediately have a bad taste in our mouth or bad thoughts in our minds but listen to the name of Lucifer and what it means it means bright shining star of the morning this is who Lucifer was meant to be but we know that that's not who he became. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. The third thing that we learn about angels is that, and even demons is that they come from God. Now listen to me very carefully. God is good and God only creates that which is good. But everything that is created comes from the very hand of God. Look at Colossians 
uh, verse uh, 16 and 17 in the first chapter. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. You see, God created two forms of spiritual beings. One is you and I. You're not just the material. You have a spiritual side to you. That is why you're here, because it is the spiritual that connects with the spiritual of God. But then there are the angelic beings that God has created as well, meant to be servants who not only sing his praises, but also do the work and the will of God in the kingdom of God and in heaven itself. But here's the thing, one of the very first lessons that we learn that God incorporates into creation is free will. We learn this through the story of Genesis chapter 3, right? With Adam and Eve when they choose not to follow the one rule that God had given them, but they chose their free will and instead to touch the apple that God told them and to eat of the apple that God told them not to eat of. But just as we and I have been given free will, Angels have been given free will. Why does God give us free will? Because God doesn't want robots. God doesn't want people that are forced to worship him. God wants people to make a choice to worship him. God wants people to come on their own free will to give of themselves to God. And so angels are given that very same choice as well. And so demons are angels who were created to serve God, but who instead decided to pursue their own power and their own interests. In Jude 1, chapter, uh, verse 6, it says, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in the darkness and bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So demons are angels who were created to be good, but given the free will and chose to pursue their own interests instead of that of the interests of God, who chose to pursue their own will and desires instead of the will and the desires of God. And the result that they paid is that they were banished from heaven, as Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden as well. Brothers and sisters, the scriptures make very clear for us that there is a war that is going on, and we're not fighting the powers of the flesh you see, the enemy is not the Democrats, and the enemy is not the Republicans, and the enemy isn't even the Taliban. No, it is the unseen powers and principalities that are all around us, and they are fighting and waging war against one another. Because the scriptures make very clear that it is Lucifer, that it is Satan and his angels who are battling against God. And there is a battle that's going on, and whether you recognize it or not, you as followers of Jesus Christ are swept up into that battle. And we need to name it, and we need to claim it. You see, the devil's goal is division. He wants to separate you from God any way and every way that he can. He wants to create separation spiritually and physically between you and God and God's people. But he not only fights that on an individual basis, he wants to create division within the church as well. Because he knows that a church that is focused on battling against itself is a church that will be so focused on itself, it cannot be focused on the power and the plan of building the kingdom of God here on earth. You see, now, the, the, the goal of Satan isn't so much to defeat you, to make you fail, as it is just to get you out of the game. He doesn't necessarily want you to blow an ACL so you can no longer get in the game. He just wants to get you on the bench and have you stay on the bench. And so you and I need to recognize that we are caught up because if you are a follower of Jesus, that means that you are determined to not only do the will of God, but that you are meant to be in the game and to work for the building of the kingdom of God. And what that means is that this battle is not just a corporate battle. It's not just Satan against God's church or the body of Christ. What it also means is that this is a very personal battle as well. It is a personal battle that all of us are waged in. 
It's a personal battle because there's a war that goes on within each of us. And it's a war that we fight each and every day. It is the choice as to whether or not we're going to speak for God or we're going to hold our tongue. It is the choice of whether or not we're going to live for God today or whether or not we're going to live as the world does. It's a choice of whether we're going to listen to the promptings and follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit or we're going to do what we want to do and what God and, uh, and what uh, others or the world wants us to do. There is a battle that's going on and it is not only a battle of God and, and his church against Satan, but it is a battle and a war that is going on deep within each and every one of us. But here's the problem with all of us is that we realize that we're powerless over those battles. Couldn't you relate to the reading from Paul? who was saying that, you know, I know what is good, I know what is right, I know what is God's will, and yet it seems that I go and I do what I do not want to do. I do, I want to do good, but then what happens is I end up doing bad because I fall prey to sin's influence upon my own life. Brothers and sisters, don't you recognize that struggle deep within your own life? I mean, that struggle is, is something that all of us have encountered at one time or another. So what happens is that many times it's, it's not necessarily a, a, a huge moral issue that we're struggling with. Many times it's just a smaller thing. It's, it may be a habit. It might be an attitude. It might even be a, a relationship that you know falls outside the will of God. And yet you begin to make excuses about it and you begin to say, well, it's not so bad. It's not really having an influence on me. And you, and you get used to it and you make excuses. And what we do then is we fail to understand what it is and we fail to name it for what it really is and that is sin. Sin is anything that is outside the will of God. And so there are many things in each of our lives that fall outside the will of God and yet we make accommodations. We begin to justify them to ourselves that it's okay. So how do you, how do you deal with this battle that goes on within you? Five things. Number one, you got to realize that we can't. We can't win the battle on our own. Now listen, you go to Barnes and Noble and you will see hundreds upon hundreds of authors who will say in the self-help section, you can do it. You can overcome it. You can break that habit. You can become a new person. You can have a new life. But the reality is that these powers and principalities, this battle that's going on is not only greater, it is stronger than you and I. And the very first thing that you and I have to do is to step out and to say against everything that American cultural society tells us and to say that I can't, but God can. You've got to be able to say that I can't overcome this. I can't fight this battle. I can't wage it on my own. You see, here's the thing. Is that many of us want to fight it. And we've been walking that alone. But when you are on that journey alone, when you're fighting that battle alone, you are easy prey to be picked off. You are easy prey to fall down and to be tripped up. The problem with many Christians today is that they're not growing spiritually. That they, in many churches, we have Christians who come to worship and that's all they do. They walk in these doors and they walk out. And they've got what we mentioned last week, that member mentality that the church is about them and that the pastor is there for them and that the programs and the ministries are meant for them. And so they come here and they want to be spoon fed and they want to be coddled and they want to be nurtured for themselves. And once they get their spiritual high, they walk out the door and they have no other obligations to the body of Christ, to the brothers and sisters sitting next to them, or even to the mission of God through the church. And that's it. We got a lot of spiritual babies in the church, not this, this church, but every other church, the church across the street, the church down the road, the church on the other side of the river. We got to be intentional about growing up spiritually in 2013, brothers and sisters. And that means that it starts first with recognizing you can't do it alone. Secondly, we got to learn to live. You ready for this? under authority. Now, does that make you bristle? Because the fact of the matter is, as Americans, we love our freedom, don't we? 
We love the freedom of choice. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we might choose that which is bad or that which is outside the will of God. We just want to keep the door open so that we have that choice available to us. But when you say that you're going to follow Jesus, when you say that you're going to walk in his path, what you're doing is you are closing the door to what the world says in terms of how we live and saying that there is only one voice, there is only one path, there is only one way that I'm going to live and I am going to live live under authority because there are a lot of things and there are a lot of people that want to influence you to make decisions to live like they are but there's only one who is all-knowing only one who is all-powerful and only one who has all wisdom to guide you you know the fact of the matter is we got to live under authority you know it's fun being a child isn't it I mean, it's pretty easy being a child because, you know, mamas and daddies, they provide all, everything you need. They provide the food, you know, they provide the clothes, they provide the shelter, they provide the love and they provide the guidance. But the fact of the matter is you and I need to recognize that we need to grow up spiritually. And it means we need to be intentional about growing spiritually. Too many Christians are claiming that they're born again and yet they live in this spiritual state of childhood. So why are we talking about angels and demons? Because we're dealing with the unseen powers and principalities that want to keep you exactly where you are. They don't want you making progress. They don't want you growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't want you expanding the knowledge of God in your heart and in your mind. They don't want you getting spiritual power so that you can wage war with God behind your back. The third thing is we got to travel together. You see, you cannot do this life journey by yourself. You've got to have travelers along the path with you. And here's the thing that's most difficult for us is that we are raised in an individualistic society. And we're, we're even caught up in this lie that Satan has put out is that your spiritual journey is private. It's your own business. It's only between you and God and it's nobody else's business. And if they start to ask about or they start to inquire or they start to, to get into your life, you begin to think to yourself, get your nose out of my spiritual business. You see, the fact of the matter is Jesus gave us an example. He needed the disciples and the disciples needed him. Brothers and sisters, if you come to church and you spend an hour here in worship and then you walk out the doors and you aren't a part of a small group, you haven't done church for this week. You haven't been a follower of Jesus because Jesus was in a small group every single day. You need to get involved with other Christians, a place where you not only get into God's word, but where you share life together where you are encouraged and at times where you are even chastised or challenged to straighten up and to walk the straight and narrow and to put your nose to the spiritual grindstone and to be about the work and the will of God. Number four, we have to maintain constant radio contact. You see, you've got to learn to distinguish the voice of God from all of the other voices of the world. The fact of the matter is that there are a ton of voices, a ton of things and people and, and, and institutions that are speaking about who you should be and how you should live your life. Here's the thing. How do you discern that between the voice of God? It's why in the next in a couple of weeks, we're going to spend an entire message on how you can know what God's voice is so that you can discern it from all of the other voices. Because I can guarantee you one thing, all of those other voices are pushing their own agenda and they want you to do other things. And most of the time, it is not in line with God's will. It is not in God's agenda or in God's ways. You need to recognize that you need to tune yourself and me and be in constant radio contact. This is why God and through Jesus Christ and through Paul tells us that you are to pray constantly. And it starts first with prayer. Listen to Paul in his letter to the church at Ephesus. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Pray also for me whenever I speak. You see, here's Paul, and he's saying, you need to be about prayer, but he's also calling the, the Christians at Ephesus and say, but be in prayer for me. 
You see, that means that you need to be recognizing, you need to be praying for that family. I want to tell you something that I've experienced yesterday that I've never experienced in my entire life of 25 years of ministry. I had a family that called up from the community and said, we'd like to hold a, a, a church a memorial service here for my mother. She was 46 years old, had diabetes and all of the complications that went about it. And she died this past weekend. Could we use your sanctuary to come and have a funeral? So I met with the, the daughter and, and family friend that lived with the, uh, the mother uh, who was now deceased. And, and we planned the service. And, and, and I got the information that I needed to write a eulogy. And, and I spent uh, several hours this week working on a eulogy and pulling the service together. Uh, they wanted music. And so uh, I got um, Adrian to come and to sing. And, and Brandon was going to play his violin as a part of the service. And then I asked Reuben as our lay leader for 2013 to come and to give church condolences and church welcome. And so we had four people that had contributed between 15 and 20 hours to making this service, a memorial service to celebrate. And we saw it as an outreach opportunity. And the service was at 1030. And do you know who showed up? No one. No one showed up. I've never, I've never experienced anything like that in my entire life. So I called, I called my best friend in ministry on the drive home and he and I were talking and he was sharing some things that had kind of gone wrong in his week this past week and, and I shared that experience with him and you know what he said to me? He said, hey, you been praying for that family this week? Yes, I've been praying for that family. Did you pray with them when they were here? Yes, I prayed when they were here. He said, then you did what you should have been doing. And if they didn't come for whatever reason, you did what we're called to do. And this is exactly what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that we need to be in prayer for one another. It's not about necessarily praying for yourself all the time. And let's remind ourselves that prayer, prayer is not a monologue of talking to God. It is a conversation with God, which means you spend more time listening than you do talking to God. The second thing that we do is to get into God's word. It's a way to, to stay in constant radio contact. And so if you're not reading through the scriptures, you need to be doing so. Our new bishop has called all United Methodists to begin reading through the New Testament and to read one chapter a week. And so I want to encourage you and challenge you beginning tomorrow that you begin to pray and every day, but that you read starting tomorrow, chapter 1, Gospel of Matthew. Tuesday, chapter 2, Gospel of Matthew. Wednesday, chapter 3, Gospel of Matthew. Are you getting it? Write it down. Which she wants all 130,000 Methodists across the state of Louisiana reading through the Gospels and reading through the letters of the New Testament in 2013. And this is a great discipline to get you to do that and to know that there are other brothers and sisters that are doing exactly the same thing. Lastly, you got to look for alternative routes. That is to say that if you keep doing the same thing that you did in 2012, you better expect the same results that you had in 2012 for 2013. Who wants a better year in 2013? Raise your hand. Who wants more of God in your life for 2013? Raise your hand. Who wants more spiritual blessings? Who wants to be growing more spiritually and to grow closer to God? Raise your hand. Then that means you've got to do things differently from 2012 to 2013. You've got to look for a different path, an alternative path. You see, here's the thing, is that most of us are creatures of habit. And what that means is that change is tough, isn't it? I mean, that we, we have habits, both good and both bad. And even with the bad habits that we know that we should change, but because they're habits and we're comfortable with them, it is difficult to let go of them. Whether that be a habit with alcohol, or whether it be a habit with drugs, or whether that be smoking, or whether that be living as the world does, or hanging out with the wrong types of people, you and I have habits, uh, you know, I went to lunch with a friend this week, and, and uh, I hadn't seen him since just before uh, uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, and he and I had gone out to dinner. And in that ensuing two weeks, uh, he had made a commitment that he was going to start to lose weight. And when I saw him, I saw he was so much thinner. And, and he said, well, can you see? I've lost 20 pounds since Christmas. I said, how did you do that? He said, I stopped eating after 6 o'clock at night. That's it. 
But you see, he had a habit of eating after 6 o'clock, sometimes at 8 o'clock, and sometimes at 9 o'clock, and sometimes at 10 o'clock. But it was a habit, but it's hard to change that habit. When the, uh, America was expanding out west and the, the uh, colonists were beginning to move and the settlers were starting to expand out, what happened is that those first settlers, as they headed west, began with their wagons. And what it began to do was to, to dig a, a pathway in the dirt as they moved west. And as it rained, many of those then uh, wagons would, would begin to sink a little bit, and it would begin to create these ruts. And so they were almost like train tracks, you know, that, that it was it, when you chose a path, you put your wagon in those ruts because it was a well-worn path. It was a hard path. But here's the thing. Wherever that rut was and wherever that rut was leading, that's where you were going to end up. You didn't have a choice because your wagon weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And that's the way it often is within our life, is we have these habits and we have these ruts in our life. And it is difficult to pick up and to move the wheels out and to have a different path. This is why last fall we began to prepare you for 2013 with the Great Methodist Challenge, to challenge you to live by the means of grace, to have Holy Communion and to be in worship every Sunday, to be praying to God every single day, to be reading God's Word every day, to be fasting once a week. You fast so that you not only deny yourself in the midst of a society that says, you don't deny, need to deny yourself of anything. You, can, you need to have it now. You need to deserve a break today. You know, it's a society that says, whatever your whim is, go ahead. You can go ahead and charge it. It doesn't matter if you can't afford it, but you can have that right now in a society that says, don't deny yourself anything. We are meant to deny ourselves because Jesus denied himself on the way to the cross. We fast and we take that time that would have gone into preparing food and eating the food and cleaning up after dinner and we instead devote that to prayer and to reading God's word, to fast one day a week. And then you are to be involved in a Bible study with other Christians. You see, these are the new habits. These are the, the, the new ruts that you're meant to. And, it, and, and these are the things that will develop your relationship with Jesus Christ. And here's the thing, we develop, for those of you that really want to be a Methodist, we're going to, by practice, we're going to give you a Methodist card and on that card, it's got all 52 weeks uh, sir, uh, printed around the edges of that. And on that card, it lists the means of grace that I just mentioned. And when you go to your Bible study, then when, if you have lived up to all five of the means of grace, you're going to get that number punched to say, yes, I was a Methodist this week through prayer and through Bible study and through small groups and through fasting and through worship and Holy Communion. It's about developing new habits and new ways and new paths for you to live in. Some of you are battling with old habits. Habits that have been with you, habits that have been holding you down. Habits that you've been struggling with perhaps for weeks or months or for some of you for even years. You can't do it alone, but with God's power, he can so I want to take a moment this morning that as we conclude this message, for those of you that are struggling with something in your life, an old habit, an old rut, an old relationship that continues to dog you, whatever it is, for you to come and to kneel down at the communion rail and the prayer rail, that you come and you lay it before God and you give it over to him and you say to him, God, I can't, but you can. If you're struggling, there's no better way to start your journey of 2013, to name what, you're, what you are struggling with, to name it for what it is. It is a sin that is outside the will of God. And it may not necessarily be a bad or an evil thing. It's just not what God wants for you. I want to invite you to come and to kneel before God and to give it to him and to say, I can't, but you can